All right, good morning. This is Sunny School. If your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And then actually go over to the book of Proverbs for a minute. I've been doing a little kind of study and research in the book of Proverbs, and I would suggest you guys uh, look at that. Uh, there's a lot of really good information in there. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I've read recently um, you know, is, is here in Proverbs chapter number 16, in verse number 25. And I... Uh, I read it as, it as it writes here. It says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we look at the course of the world and how it functions, and obviously we understand that you know, Satan and his plan of evil is very pervasive. I had a discussion this week with my buddy, and as we're just talking about it, I didn't plan on having a two-hour and ten-minute discussion on Friday night about the gospel with a lost person, but I did. <laughs> um, so we, we really got into it deep, and, and uh, you know, he, he, he was interested in this, and he said, you know, I just feel like this, this is the right way, this is the right way. And then after our discussion, he said, well, it seems like Satan's winning, huh? And I go, no, Satan can't win. <laughs> he'll, he'll never win. I said, I said, it appears. It appears that he's winning, but he's not. So we got into some issues of the faith. And at the end, at the, end of the conversation, uh, he goes, man, this is, pretty, this is pretty interesting. Like, I mean, I'm, 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 he basically said, I'm almost convinced, right? And I said, you know what? In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul talks to Agrippa, and Agrippa says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. And I said, well, what's your problem? Where's the almost? And he goes, no, you're making a lot of logic and sense, and it's, this, is, this is really, I really feel like this is probably the right answer. I said, so what's preventing you from believing? I said, let me just tell you right now, you need to believe this. And he goes, well, how do I do that? <laughs> right? What does it mean to believe? And in his mind, he starts to like, you know, contemplate, do I, do I have, is there like an action that I do? And I said, I can't tell you how you believe. I can tell you that you trust by faith that Christ died for your sins, spared and rose again, and you'll have eternal life. And he's like, it's really that easy. And I'm like, yeah, 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 it is. And he, and he, he really, I don't know where, where we, we, I haven't talked to him since Friday, but it was just a very random conversation. And just, uh, he called me out of the blue. I haven't talked to him in a little bit. It was two hours and 10 minutes on the phone and uh it was it was good but you know i I think about this verse right there's a way that seemeth right in a man he kept saying well i'm just gonna do i'm just gonna be a good person (laughs) and i asked him i said you know do you really think you're good and he goes i mean yeah compared to and then he starts filling in the blanks child molesters rapists murderers i'm like "Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 but that's the that's the, you know, I understand what you're trying to go on the extreme, but you don't know what righteousness is. You have not been exposed to God's righteousness. So then I hit him with the issue of the mind. And I said, let's just say that I see your mind for one day. And he goes, man, you do not want to be in that thing. It's, it's going to be dirty. There's a lot of bad stuff going on in there. And I said, I said but God sees all that, and he's gonna, he's gonna, he, he will keep a record in a book of everything that you thought about. How about that? And he goes, oh, man, that's not going to be good, right? So then he asked me, do I, do I still sin? And we got into that concept. And I said, well, no, I can't sin anymore. My, my, flesh, is, my flesh can sin, but my, the new creature in Christ Jesus does not sin, right? And we got into that, and he was like, wow, that's interesting, right? So how do you live your life? But there is a way that seemeth right in the man, that the end thereof are the ways of death. I just encourage you guys to look at the, the uh, book of Proverbs and read through it. So many good verses in here that you will you will come away with, and as you're going through your life, you'll start applying it. The soft answer turneth away wrath, right? You go, oh wow! All of a sudden, that comes out. I like this one: the simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge, right? And you go, wow! This, so many of this is so important and profound, and if and if God put it in the Scripture, we should look at it. You know, one of my favorite verses of all times is Proverbs three, five, and six. If you don't have that memorized, you need to memorize that, right? You guys know it. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. People always say, well, I don't know. In the, in the dispensation of grace, is God directing our paths? Yes. Yes. With the word. He directs your path when you trust in him yeah. and you know the word of God. Yeah. Be not unwise, but wise concerning what the will of the Lord is, right? I think about Romans chapter 12 and verse number you know, 2 where, you know, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many people are going to go to church today and go, man, I would love to know the will of God for my life? And they're going to, they're going to, pray, they're going to pray fervently for it. They're going to desire it. Have, they're, they're going to say, Heavenly Father, show me your will. Right? And then when a new circumstance or a new issue comes in, they go, that's, that's the one or this is the thing. Or that, I, I come back to it and go, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart, that is the issue of faith. With all your heart. And lean not on your what? On your own understanding. That is the issue with, where, where in, in Proverbs 16.25 where he's getting in and saying that, 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 that the, the, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the render of is the ways of death. So taking you know, the Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and then applying it to the, the Proverbs 16, 25, we see that we have to have a new way of thinking, and that's the Romans 12, 2 type of thinking. That you be transformed, that you renew your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable. And it's not just you know what that good and acceptable will of God is. Paul says you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove it. You know, people say things like, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Well, prove it to me, <laughs> right? I've heard that one. I don't know if you really are sorry. Prove it. Well, how do you prove it? You demonstrate it. You show it. In our life, we live it. We live it out. You know, we, our life that we have is, is, is so interesting in, in the way that Paul says it in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. And what she says, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, right? I live by the faith of the Son of God, who did what? Me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. What a renewed sense of, 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 of purpose and focus and just hope and peace and all the things that come with it. And so if you could simplify you know, the sermon today, I'm going to talk about the resurrection and how all of these pieces come back to a renewed way of thinking about your end. <laughs> the new way of thinking about your end. Every man has an end. When is that going to be? I don't know. You know, I, I, I told you last week we had a friend of ours who was a, a surgeon and, and unfortunately he succumbed to suicide. You know, sad situation, right? Young, not that old, and, you know, just, just happens, right? And, and through that process, I've talked to a lot of other people and I've had some conversations, but I always come back to, you know, I want to give the individual a little bit of hope. And in the hope that we have, as Paul says in Romans chapter number 8, we are saved as we patiently wait for what? The redemption of our bodies. Rebecca's talking about her diet. And, you know, I'm doing this and doing that. Why? Because it's for your body's sake, right? We do a lot of things for our body's sake. You know what sometimes we don't do? We forget to exercise in the spiritual way for our spiritual mind and our spiritual body, right? So let's look at these verses. Go over to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Just, just if, you, if you would during the week, open up and just read a couple of the, 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 the passages in Proverbs. <laughs> you know, for, for a guy like me, I'm reading the, the first couple chapters, and uh, it's just so funny because he caught, he, he's saying the things, my son, yeah. my son, my son, my son, Right? And so I look at when I instruct Noah and I teach Noah, I have that heart to teach him in the ways and the admonition of the Lord, to instruct him in the ways of righteousness, to teach him about who God is, to tell him to study the word of God. And when, when, uh, when, when, it, when it writes here that he says, you know, my son, if thou wilt, right? So many people will not receive it. It's up to you. You hear the words, you hear the truths, you can hear the, the profound wisdom that's here, but it's up to you to get the wisdom, right? And I, and I, will, I will say that uh, this, this, these, some of these passages have really helped me, even though they're not part of the dispensation of the grace of God. Because those things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. Just this week I was talking about, you know, how, how <laughs> we're talking about Moses, we're talking about David, and we're talking about Samson, three different people in the Bible. And I said, it's just, you know, it's so fortunate sometimes that, that their record of their life <laughs> has to include some of the real big problems that they did, Right? But God did that for the purpose of us as an edification piece to know that those individuals, regardless of their sin issue, David says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So even a man under the law understands the freedom that he can get when God says, you are forgiven. So in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is the second big passage of scripture about the resurrection and about the rapture. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're reading the last couple weeks. 
and we've been studying that. We are not to sorrow as others which have no hope, right? right. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, when I was going through uh, one of my major life experiences, which you guys are aware of, you know, in that scenario, I had a lot of people that were telling me, well, you know, just don't be anxious. Don't be, don't be sad. Don't, and you're like, that doesn't work. Like, you can't just tell somebody not to be sorrowful. You can't tell somebody. So what, what the, the best advice I ever got was, was allow the sorrow to work itself out for the purpose that God provides it to you for. And I was like, wow, how do, how, do I, how do I really do that? And I went on the mission of life to determine how God uses the, the tribulation to work out patience, the patience to work out experience, and the experience to ultimately bring about what? Hope. So in life, I'm very, I'm very much a, a motivational Christian. <laughs> you follow me? I want to motivate you to feel a specific way. Because, let me clarify this. Knowledge is great. It is great. Okay? But when Paul talks about in the book of Philippians, you know, if there's any consolation in Christ, right? If there's any comfort of love, well, well would that not necessarily be a feeling? Yeah. Absolutely. That the, that, the, that, the, that if the love of Christ is shed abroad in your hearts, right? And the hope maketh not ashamed, don't you, don't you know that that would be a feeling? If you say there's therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, is that not a feeling of relief? <laughs> Absolutely. So then we have to remember that our feelings will lie to us. It'll tell us in some days, well, you know, that, that there's no possibility that you are really justified. Are you really justified? Look at your actions. Look at your paper. And that's when you do what? You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You lean not onto your own understanding. You not go back to the ways of man, man's thinking. And you go, if God says it, I believe it. That settles it, right? <laughs> That's what I used. To, I was told as a, as a very young kid from the pulpit, you know. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. So there's nothing else. To, there's nothing else to do. So in First Corinthians chapter 15, he really he really is very uh, adamant in the end of chapter number 14 that God is not the author of confusion, that He is the author of peace, as in all the churches and of all the saints. And he gets down to the very end, and he says in verse number 40 that all things that are happening within the church, let them be done decently. And in order. For a real nice type A person like me, I love it. <laughs> I love things to be decent and in order. And in verse number 1 of chapter 15, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So now this comes back as a result of what's happening. Paul has been made aware that there's been disputations, that there's issues. And if you remember in the very beginning of the book of 1 Corinthians... Uh, that, that there were, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 11, that there were contentions that were being had, and part of that contentions and disputations and disagreements were told to him by the household of Chloe. And in 1 Corinthians 15, the issue of the resurrection was one of those things that I believe that, that was addressed, that he was made aware of, that she had told him, and so the household of Chloe said that you're, you're teaching also that there's no resurrection. We looked last week in Matthew chapter 27, at the resurrection that occurred after the death of Christ. If you guys remember the saints that came out of the graves, yes? Yeah. Right? And we said that that's a possibility that they were thinking that some of the people were going, well, that's what that was, and, and the resurrection's passed already, right? Remember? And there was guys in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Hymenaeus and Philitus, who were preaching that, and it was try they were trying to overthrow the faith of some, right? And then there were others that were saying the resurrection's passed, and some were saying there's no resurrection at all, right? Where do you think that all came from? The Jews, <laughs> the Judaizers, right? That's what they were doing. They, were, they, they, they definitely infiltrated the church. And in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. We've talked about this a couple times. I'm not going to get into it. Just the issue of the believing in vain is simply meaning that there is no resurrection, therefore your belief doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, you would believe and there's nothing, there's no afterlife, there's no resurrection. So why does it really matter if you believe or not? It's all vanity because Christ is not raised. And then you're dead in your sins and you're, you're stuck, right? The gospel's not going to help you. So he says, by which also you are saved, notice this, if you keep in memory. That salvation is the constant day-to-day -day salvation. That is not your justification. He is saying that is your salvation. That is how you are saved. 
Paul in Romans chapter 8 says, we are saved by what? By hope. So how do we do that? You know, they say you are the company you keep. <laughs> you are the thoughts you think. It's true. Just like the exercise of your body, there's an exercise of your mind. And if you exercise your mind in the way that things that are profitable, edifying, building you up, it will not be an overnight thing. Let me tell you that, okay? But just like with exercise, what happens? You get a little stronger the next day, a little stronger the next day, a little stronger the next day, right? I remember growing up and running cross country and doing soccer, and I did cross country just for soccer. And the very first, you know, run of the season, I would be like dead. I mean, like, I could run a mile, and I'm like, <laughs> my heart's going 200, I'm, I think I'm dying. You know, by week two, I'm perfectly capable to run that mile, no issue. And then by the time soccer season started, and all my friends had not run cross country, I'm over there leading the pack, going, I'm ready, I'm, I'm in full physical fitness shape, ready to go. You know, Paul says, to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. There's work that needs to be evolved in this process, and, and it's not easy. Going on in verse number 3, says, For I delivered unto you all, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Amen? And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of, oh, excuse me, that he was seen of above, five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. If you remember, he was coming in and out for how many days? You guys remember how many days it was? Remember? 40. 40 days, coming in and out, in and out, right? Talking and ministering and preaching and teaching. So it's like, it wasn't like, hey, I came back for five minutes and I'm gone, see ya. No, he's there. This was presently, you know, this, there was so much activity surrounding the Lord Jesus Christ that these people saw him in multiple, multiple people saw him. When the centurion saw the com people coming out of the graves in Matthew 27, even that guy goes, surely this had to be God. I yeah. mean, sure, this had to be him. What else is going to happen, yeah. right? And that's why we're continuing to this day to preach and teach the name of Jesus Christ because it has the power, as, as we know, to seek and save that which is lost. So as he says, of the, of the greater uh, part, that they remain alive. But notice he says in verse 6, but some are fallen asleep. In other words, some have done what? Some have died. Their bodies are in the grave. They are sleeping. <clears throat> Last week, when it was Halloween week, somebody yelled at me for saying happy Halloween, by the way, on, my, uh, on the recording. I was being sarcastic, by the way. I was not wishing you happy Halloween. I was being funny. I was like, oh, it's October 31st. Happy Halloween. I said it like that, and people thought I was being serious. So <laughs> to the guy that commented on the YouTube, yeah, I don't really celebrate Halloween, but okay. Anyways, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, as we're driving um, in the car on Halloween day, there is a hearse driving next to us. It's got the casket in the back. And Noah goes, wow, look at that car. What is that? And I go, that's a hearse. And he goes, well, what is it? I go, that's, that's what carries the dead bodies around. And he goes, gets this weird shaking head. He's like, that's gross. And I'm like, why? He goes, I don't like that. He's like, can we keep driving? <laughs> he wanted to get away from that car. And we'd be like driving right next to it down Park Boulevard. I'm like, you see the hearse? You see the car in there? And then Chloe's like, there's a dead guy in there? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, what do you think? And I said, maybe not. Maybe it's just, you know, for, for show because it is Halloween. They, they might be just going somewhere. But maybe not. Maybe there is a dead guy. People die on Halloween too. And I don't know. They're transferring people around. So, so, so it was just funny to see their reaction to it and, and think about it. But I said, you know, the body's there, but the soul is not, right? So that eternality part of what it is, these guys are asleep. These guys are asleep. And some of these people were saying, so if these guys are sleeping, where are they at? And, and, if, and if Christ isn't raised up, then they're all dead and they're all perished and you're never going to see them again. You have no hope and, and you're of all men most miserable. So then he goes on to say, and after that he was seen of James and all the apostles, in verse number eight, and last of all, last of all, he was seen of me. Also, as one born out of due time, for I am, of the, I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Funny how that's what his opinion of himself is, because that's his humility. How God calls him the chief apostle, though, right? He's the chief. He received more grace, more forgiveness, but he also had the biggest ministry of any apostle out there, but he considered himself to be the least because of his, his past life and persecution of the church. 
Verse number 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. There you go. What a great verse. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. I want you to read that again. When I told you before, he says here that he is the least of the apostles, because he's not even meant to be called an apostle because of what he did in the persecution of the church of God early on. He says later on, he says, no, no. But I am, as he says here, what I am, by the grace of God. And that labor and that, and that uh, grace that he gave, it wasn't in vain because I used it. And I labored, notice that again, more abundantly than they all. Do you think that's Paul speaking as a fool? Of course, yeah. But that's by inspiration. He's telling you that his ministry and what he worked, he didn't just say he labored a little bit more. He says he labored more abundantly than they all. But notice what he, how, where, where he attributes that. Yet not I. See how it works? He's always got the Galatians 2.20 mentality. It's not me that's doing it. It's Christ doing the work through me. Right. And sometimes you get that pride when you start doing something. I, you know, I get preaching and somebody says, amazing sermon, great thing that touched me so good. Not I but Christ. Right? Not I but Christ. That's right. you gotta, you got to have that mentality. Right? So you think about it like this. I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And, 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 and if you tell me I did a great sermon, great. It wasn't me. So... When Paul says here that it was not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Notice how he says it's the grace of God that's with him. We look at salvation as this like one-time event, right? It's a lot of times. So oh, we're justified, we're good, we're done, right? And it's like you don't really realize. I would say I would love to do a sermon, and I would like to call it the benefits of being in Christ. That's what I'm going to name the sermon. The benefits of being in Christ. And I'm just going to list them all out. All it's going to be is just so many different passages on all the, all the benefits you get, right? And then through that, I hope you can realize that it is, a, it is a constant state of a relationship with God in which you will, until the day you meet him face to face, you know him as if you're known, you'll never really fully appreciate it until you see him. But I want you to get to the point where you experientially know and understand and have the peace of all the benefits that we get in Christ Jesus. So as he says in verse number 11, Therefore, whether it, it were I or they, so we preach and you believed. Okay? So clearly the apostles knew the basis of the gospel message. There's no doubt that they knew that Christ died for your sins. Do you follow what I'm saying? Through this passage right here, that he was died, that he, that he was buried, he rose again, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Right? You understand how that works? That the mystery is not that Christ died for our sins? You guys got that, right? Nobody's confused on that one? I've heard somebody say it, and that's, that's not true. Okay? So he goes on to say in verse number 12, Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? I don't think that that would really be an issue in the churches today, correct? I think that most people would say, yeah, there's got to be a resurrection of the dead. Actually, you know what? They probably don't even know that there's a resurrection of the dead. <laughs> Clarification. They may not even realize that there is. They just think you just die and you go to heaven, right? They go, so you got you die, you go to heaven, so what happens next? I don't know, I go see grandma, right? All right, well, like, do you have a body? Well, yeah, I have a body. And they have never probably thought about the unification as it relates to your soul and your new body. So if Paul says, now, if, he, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead... But if there be no resurrection of the dead, and this is his really long logical analysis. These are all these now, if, but, if, right? All those, you know, if, then statements. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And the logical conclusion that is, then if Christ be not risen, then everything I'm talking to you about in my preaching, it's vanity because it doesn't matter and I'm, I'm a liar. And then if I'm a liar and you believed what I said, now your faith is also based in a lie and it's also now vain, as he says. So if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. And verse number 15, and yea, we are found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be, that the dead rise not. So you see how much of an important part of the doctrinal issue of the resurrection is there. Now, what we look at from the resurrection perspective, our concept and our view of the resurrection relates to what? The rapture. 
the rapture and the resurrection are what? One and the same. Do we realize that? Yes? No? Is anybody colossus with me on this? Say it again. That the resurrection and the rapture are one and the same. No. Yes. Watch me. Follow me what I'm saying. The resurrection, what I mean by this is that your new body, when do you get your new body? Paul says in a moment, in twinkling an eye, we shall be what? Okay. So at the rapture. There's a change. There's a change. Is that the resurrection? Is that your new body? What is your old body doing down there? We don't care. It doesn't matter. It's going to sit in the thing and it's going to just rot out. We don't need it. It's gone. He doesn't need that. He doesn't need it. What, what did Christ make Adam and Eve out of? The dust of the ground. Okay? What do you think your new body's made out of? <laughs> it ain't the dust of the ground, I'll tell you I'm that. I'm looking forward to finding out. I can tell you that. I don't know exactly what it is, but I'll tell you this. It ain't the dust. Because what's interesting is if you look at your skin, you ever get like really bad sunburn? And then your skin starts to just peel off? And it just goes to the ground, just dust. And you're like, is that really all I am? I'm just dust, right? I'm just going to wither away? And then you think about, you know, Lot's wife turning back and looking at Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Turns into the stone. Turns into the stone and yeah. just, you know, what is that? How does, how does she turn into stone? Well, dude, she's just sand. She's just dust. What is stone? <coughs> right? So read what he says here. For if the dead rise not, <clears throat> then is Christ, it, then is not Christ raised. That's a big issue. Because again, in Romans 4, in verse number 25, he specifically says that he was delivered for our offenses and that he was raised again for our justification. So if he is not raised again, if Christ is not resurrected, then we, let me tell you this, let me tell you this already. The resurrection has already occurred. And you're like, wait, what? If you then be risen with Christ, right? It's already occurred. Like, we think, like, we're waiting for it. No, we're not waiting for it. It's already done. And I get a lot of peace from that because I go, man, I'm like, I was anxious about waiting for the resurrection. Now I'm not waiting for it anymore because it's already done. That's your mentality. If you then be risen with Christ, if you already seated at the right hand of God, if your conversation be in heaven, wow, I'm excited now. I already have all this. This is already done. Again, when I talk about those benefits of being in Christ, that's the benefit of being in Christ. We're not waiting for it. We really aren't. It's, it's, it's done. So that's how my mind has been working lately. So when I, when, I, when I preach to you all, do you know what I preach on? I don't like go and go, I'm going to pull out the uh, Bollinger's Bible and find some, you know, good little article thing or, you know, whatever. I'm going to find some cool little sermon title. I'm going to type in good sermons for this week. I don't do that. You know what I preach? I preach at whatever is on my heart for that week based upon what I've been studying and what I've been thinking about all week long. And the resurrection, the rapture, and the new body, and all that, this is what's been in my mind. I, I, can't, I can't get it out right now. You know, We're going to go back to the, the issue of James and, and, and Paul and all that fun stuff. We are going to get into the faith of works issue. Yes, we are going to finish the book of Acts. I know. I know you guys want to hear it. I can't wait to get into all the legalities of Paul's appellate process, right? And all the court system and all the things that he does and how he you know, claims his citizenship as being Rome. And he gets, because of his Roman citizenship, he has due process rights. And I'm going to get into all that fun stuff, right? It's always very interesting. But these particular passages I preach because, to me, they are so important from a, from a communication of what the gospel is. In terms of, you ever heard somebody say, I want to preach to you the full gospel? <laughs> you know what I mean by that? They could preach you some Pentecostal type of gospel message. I'll preach you the full gospel message. You not have been indwelt with the Holy Spirit yet? Well, I'll tell you, listen, yeah, yeah, I'm indwelt with the Holy Spirit, but I'm, I'm so far beyond that. I, I, already, I already am risen with Christ. I'm already seated with, I'm seated with him together in the heavenly places with Christ. He goes on to say, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ what? Raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Big problem because again, Christ was delivered for our offenses and he was raised again for our justification. As I said millions of times from this pulpit, the issue of Christ dying, no big deal. Everybody can do that. Anybody can be put on a cross and be crucified. Christ says that he lays down his life. 
He says that no man taketh his life, but that he lays it down. And if he lays it down, what will he do again? He can take it back up. He holds those keys. He holds the keys to death. He has conquered death. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse number 54, when he writes, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. My buddy asked me, is, is Satan winning? No, bro, he ain't winning. <laughs> he can't win. It might appear that he's winning, but he's right now, you know what he's trying to do? He's pulling out any trick in the book to try to just make his time here that he has, which is very short, to confuse. What does a thief come to do? Steal and kill. John 10, right? So John 10, and I, co I come that they may have life and they have life more abundantly. The thief cometh to do what? Thief cometh to seek, to kill, to destroy, to teach you lies. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 55, he makes this statement, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? That's a taunt. You see how that works? You ever been to a, a football game or, you know, where they make a little statement? Back in the day for us, I uh, forget the K KCS, we're the best. We used to always sing that. It would really make people really mad. And we, just, we would cheer it and clap it and cheer it and clap it. And then they, the other team would just be so mad. That's kind of what, 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 we're, what Paul is doing to death. He's going, oh, death, where is thy sting? You ain't got no sting. Oh, death, where is thy victory? You don't have victory. He says, the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But again, as we always do, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man. Now, you know, in verse number 58, we always stop at 57. Read 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, we talked about the karmaic principle with my buddy on the phone the other day, and he was talking about karma. He's like, what do you believe about karma? Well, I said, if you, re if you, if you sow to the flesh, you should reap corruption. And I said, if you sow to the spirit, you should reap life everlasting. And he goes, what does that mean? <laughs> and I said, well, right now, today, you're treasuring up wrath into the day of wrath and the righteous revelation of the judgment of God who will render to you according to your words. That's what you're sowing. That's your karmic principle. And he's like, well, no, I'm, I'm talking about like with people and what I do. I said, no, none of that matters. I said, your, your issue right now is God either sees you in Christ or he sees you out of Christ. Take your pick. And the choice, the choice is yours. You get the free will to, to believe or not believe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, go back over here. I want to read a couple of these verses and I want to keep this to about 38 minutes. We have a few more minutes. So if Paul says here in verse number 19, if in this life, as he says, if in this life only, so if you're just going to use Christ is your little crutch to get through this life, you're just going to be a real miserable person. But if it's in this life only, we have a hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I, I love that verse. I love hearing it. I love reading it. I like just thinking about it. Because when anybody tells me that they ha they're not miserable without Christ, I say, you're a liar. Because you can't find any hope, any peace, anywhere outside of Christ. It won't happen. You can't find it. So in verse number 20, Paul's going to go through this issue of the resurrection. And he uses this phrase, which he uses many times throughout the scripture. And I think Russ said last week, how many times did you say it was in there? 16 or something? What was it? The, phrase, the word but now? Yeah, I, I got 19. 19? I, I, I think I've got one that I duplicated, so probably 18. Okay, 18. This is one of those but nows. But now, and he's saying, but now is Christ. In other words, he's saying he is risen from the dead. But now he is. And as a result of that, and he's become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, 
we don't really understand the concepts of like first fruits because we don't really have gardens and planting and plowing and, and you know all those type of pieces, right? We don't really we don't we don't do that as much. But the first fruits would be your first fruits of your harvest. And what would you do with those first fruits? Well, as a, from an offering perspective, that's the that's the best stuff. We want, yeah, these are the good. These are first fruits. This is an offering of first fruits. We like this. They would understand what that meant. So from that picture, because because here's what happens. Um, if you ever done plots of land, and my buddies do it like they do, it's pretty crazy what they do. They have it like all broken up into sectors. And this is the soybeans. This is the peanuts. This is the corn, and the crops get rotated. Do you know that they rotate them around the yeah. field? Like we don't, we're not going to grow soybeans on this thing next year. We're going to grow corn on there next year. Sometimes they skip it. And you're like, that's weird. Like, why would you do that? Like, because I don't know anything about it. But they say, well, if we do it one year, then it, the, the soil won't be ready, right? So we need to have a new type of soil, meaning whether we, we skip a year or we put a new type of plant in there that's not as, you know, invasive on the on the soil. But the first fruits of them that slept is the picture of the hope. In other words. If you have first fruits, what else do you have? You got second fruits and third fruits and fourth fruits. You got more to come. Now, before we get into all this issue of the order of resurrection, because we're already almost done, I want to talk to you about a couple pieces that are really hard, uh, deeper in, in, in information about this type of, of approach, right? They're in throughout the book of Revelation. We see individuals and we see people that are in heaven. We see the communication. We see the talking. We see individuals that are, as, as you read through the scripture, um, uh, already in a, in a state of communication. So what, we're going to annihilate any concept of soul sleep, right? In other words, that the resurrection has to occur of your, of your body before you're even coherent or aware, and that you will just go into the grave and you'll have no understanding, you sleep, and then God will then raise up your body. That's, that's a lie. That, that's not true at all, okay? And I think we can really just go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and that would tell you very clearly that you know that we would be absent from the body is to be as he says present with the lord and 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 if you're not if you're not going to be present with him you know how does that what do you mean by present right it's this it's basically it's the fulfillment of the translatory issue of going from this world right to the heavenly realm okay but so what i want to say is this uh in the next so in next week i'm going to talk about these couple verses and paul i'm just going to read these with you okay but Paul says this, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. We go through that Romans chapter number 5 approach, right? For in Adam all die, in Christ all shall be what? Made alive. Okay, let me tell you this. How do you think Moses is going to be resurrected? As a result of the resurrection of Christ. You follow what I'm saying? There's only only way that Moses gets resurrected is through what Christ has done. You follow me? So when Paul says, the propitiation for the sins that are past, remember that? Romans, Romans chapter number three, that issue of those past sins. People will say, I've heard actually somebody tell me, those are your, that's how it works. The way you get saved is your past sins get forgiven. But then everything after that's your responsibility. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, you guys have heard that. It's a real weird, they, and they use that verse. You know, for the sins, for the remission of sins that are past. That's what I think that's what the passage says, the remission of sins that are past. Well, no, that's the remission of those sins that are past in times past. Those are the ones that are being passed. He's going to take care of all sin. When, 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 when David says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, he does it on the basis of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Abraham is said in Romans chapter 4, when it says, now what shall we say then that Abraham hath pertained to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he have wore up the glory, but not before God. Abraham was justified by faith, not in Christ Jesus, follow me, but he was justified by Christ Jesus. Because anybody who's ever going to be justified is done on the basis of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because without the, 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 the propitiation and the atonement for what God did for the world, there's no, there's no forgiveness. So that's where we get into the issue of Abraham, Abraham's bosom and the temporal issue of why they're there until Christ goes up into the Holy of Holies and performs this, the issues that he does in there. We're, we're going to talk about all that fun stuff because they were types and figures and things that were done in the temple were actually done in the heavenlies, right? And when that particular t- thing took place, you read in the book of Ephesians, then he did what? He led captivity captive. Pretty interesting, good, good material. So was an Adam all die, 
One more minute. He says, even so in Christ, notice this, shall all be made alive. Every single person that will ever be resurrected is going to be resurrected because of what Christ did. That's it. You can't get resurrected without Christ. Well, I want to be reincarnated as a butterfly. Sorry, not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. You know, what a weird thing. And I've had friends of mine tell me, you know, for all the threadfin that you've ever killed, God's going to reincarnate you back into a, into a threadfin herring because you've killed billions of them. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I have. But they're, you know what their, per, their whole existence and purpose is? To be killed. They're bait fish. Bait fish. They, they're used for bait. I don't know what to tell you. That's what they do. And then I said, I got a verse for that. In the very beginning of the book of Genesis, the Lord Jesus Christ tells Adam that you have dominion over everything. Especially the fish. Especially those fish. So we're going to stop. We're 40 minutes in. So that order of the resurrection, the first fruits, what takes place. We're going to compare some of those issues with the rapture. Look at some of the issues as it relates to, um, like, the great white throne, for example, where it says, like, and the rest of the dead, you know, were, did, not, were not, did not live until, you know, the thousand years were passed. Right, and then we see how that resurrection takes place, and what then they are doing. Right, so um, don't don't believe in the false doctrine of annihilationism. That is not true. That is not true. People have a soul, and it will spend eternity somewhere. Let's close in prayer.